Hello, this is uh, Risky Dawood, a geopolitical analyst at Mayor Risk LLC. I'm also the editor of the North Africa Journal. Today, the 20th of August, 2024, let's talk about Libya. Well, let's see if you were born in 1990, you are now 34 years old. This means in 2011, you just turned 21, and unless you were born interested in global politics, you probably don't even know who Muammar Gaddafi is. Well, let me give you a two to three minute background. Muammar Gaddafi was Libya's top leader. Uh, with his comrades of the military, he toppled King Idris, the ruler of Libya, back in 1969. And since then, he ruled until 2011. Then came the so-called Jasmine Revolution, which started in neighboring Tunisia, essentially bringing the Arab masses to the street, demanding better governance and a better economy. Libya was swept away by that popular uprising. So was dictator Muammar Gaddafi, who was eventually murdered after he was captured by a very angry mob. In his 42 years as a dictator, Gaddafi first built a system of cronyism that allowed him to control entire regions and populations. He used both the stick and the carrot policy, often distributing generous benefits to the populations thanks to the country's oil wealth, but also often arresting and killing anyone who had different political ideas than his. Later on, as his children became adults, he favored nepotism. Gaddafi had eight biological children and two adopted ones. Two of his biological sons carry names that conveyed a certain misplaced nationalism. One is Saif al-Islam, or the Sword of Islam. The other is Saif al-Arab, or the Sword of the Arabs. The toppling of King Idris in 69 by Gaddafi was meant to somehow liberate the Libyan people from an outdated uh, monarchical system. Even though many historians say that King Idris was not necessarily a tyrant, a tough leader, or an authoritarian leader, as he was not a, a risk taker and very much a conservative figure, he struggled to deal with both fast-moving global geopolitical events of his time, and obviously he did not understand that the Libyan societies were also evolving. So Gaddafi obviously took advantage of that situation and went on to rule for more than 40 years. Now, as his children became adult, Gaddafi appointed them to a number of leadership and influential positions to achieve at least two goals. First, to protect his interests. And the second one is to secure the future of his family as the perpetual ruling family of Libya. The most influential of them all was Saif al-Islam Gaddafi, who was groomed to become the heir apparent. As such, he was interfering with foreign governments uh, as a de facto diplomat, but he was also involved in a number of other areas, in economic affairs, for example, and how Libya's sovereign wealth fund was to be managed and spent. Another son, al Sadi was mostly interested in football, but his father forced him to take on military responsibilities, essentially appointing him as head of an elite military unit. Mutasim Gaddafi was probably one of the ruthless figures, having been national security advisor, a role that in the Libyan context essentially means uh, how to sort of counter domestic opposition. He was also in charge of a substantial portion of the military, often competing with Saif al-Islam, in terms of uh, how to influence governors going forward and, and influence their father. I would get, without getting into more details about all of the Gaddafi's children, the Jasmine Revolution essentially put an end to the nepotism, even though Saif al-Islam is still trying to return to power today, insisting that he has some kind of a legitimacy to become the next leader of the country by virtue of being a Gaddafi. Hopefully no one is buying this argument. But not only his father was gunned down in, in a public setting, pretty gruesome uh, scene, his, his brother Saif al-Arab was killed during a NATO airstrike in April 2011. Another brother, Hamis Gaddafi, died in fighting in Tripoli in August 2011. A third brother, Mutasim, was captured the same day his father was killed. He was later executed. 
What a record. So when you look at this recent history, you would think that the leaders uh, in Libya today that are in charge of the country would learn a lesson or two and avoid the same mistakes. And those are the same mistakes that Gaddafi made. That's not the case, though. And we're now seeing essentially history repeat itself. Now, since 2011, Libya has been in quasi-civil war with two big political groups opposing each other, seeking to control the country. In Tripoli, that is in the northwest of the country, there is the Government of National Unity, which is recognized by the United Nations. The northeast is a rival government that comprises of a sort of parliament called the House of Representatives, essentially under the control of a warlord named Khalifa Haftar, commander of the so-called Libyan National Army, or LNA. Now, while most major governments in the world like to deal with Haftar, essentially legitimizing uh, an illegitimate government, the man has been working very hard to become the next Gaddafi, using the same level of ruthlessness and a high degree of nepotism. Perhaps unaware of the risks of promoting his children to high-level positions, Khalifa Haftar is reacting to the fact that he is 81 years of age and he has suffered a stroke recently. He feels that it may be wise to appoint his children to top positions to secure their future. But if history serves, there is no guarantee that such appointments would shield the children against future events. This is even more the case that the Haftar family does not have the same level of control that the Gaddafi family had. The Haftars have only the east of Libya under their control, and so they pale in comparison to what the Gaddafis achieved. Still, Haftar Sr., that is the father, is moving along, appointing his son Saddam Haftar to chief of staff of the army, joining his brother Khalid, appointed major general to oversee military intelligence. Online media outlet The Libya Observer recently reported that Saddam Haftar was promoted by his father to the rank of lieutenant general. The outlet concludes that the move was to prepare for the succession of Khalifa Haftar as the head of the military forces in East Libya. One interesting note from The Libya Observer is Haftar's sons, who hold the highest military positions and the highest ranks, have never entered any military college and have not received any academic qualifications that would qualify them to hold such ranks and positions, end of quote. The Haftar appointments are not just in the military and in security spheres. Earlier this year, Belgasim was appointed head of the Libya Development and Reconstruction Fund, tasked to handle the reconstruction of the regions that were destroyed by Storm Daniel last year. So as we look into the future of Libya, should we be worried about what fate awaits the Haftar boys? Maybe the better question is, should they worry about their own future? But for now, they're clearly settling into what they see as a comfortable position, a position of power. They are treated by Western and regional powers as official representatives of the Libyan people, even though no one voted for them. But if 2011 is a reminder of what could happen, the Haftar family should not be too comfortable as global geopolitics could push them into a situation similar to that of the Gaddafi clan. Till our next talk, thank you for listening and goodbye.